Pharisees called him a devil. Paul said, brush the doctors aside. His soldiers called him the king of the Jews, and they mocked him as he hung and died. Pilate called him an innocent man, tried to wash blood off his hands. But the crowd called aloud, and they say, you crucify that man. But I call him father, father, friend. friend. Don't be giddy, get the end. I call him a constant, constant a companion. He's been there through a thick and thin. I call him when there ain't nobody, when it's just me.
Good evening. Welcome to South Asheboro Church of God. So good to see you in God's house tonight uh, and join the revival. I tell you, we've been having the, the Holy Spirit's been moving in a mighty way around here, and we've been having a time. Praise God. And looking forward to the same thing tonight. So let us stand, if we will, as we open up the service in prayer. Has anybody got a handheld request you'd like to uh, be prayed by? Pray yes. For my mother, Jane. I yes. Yes. Pray for Sister Sandra. God will completely heal her body. Pray. pray for Bobby Swift, Miss Wife, yes. Yes, pray for her. Yes. Pray for my brother, my oldest brother. He just uh, went home today. He had new double pneumonia, so they did release him today, but pray for him. Anybody else have a request? Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we can thank you and we praise you and love you, Lord God, for this opportunity to come to you, Lord God, in prayer. Lord God, I thank you for every blessing. Lord God, touch my body this life. Lord God, touch Lord God, man, Lord God, a mighty way to cover him. Cover our heart, Lord God, Lord God, touch Lord God, touch my brother, Lord God, my brother, Lord God, touch 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 his hand, Lord God, please heal her body, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for touching his sister, Lord God, Lord, she needs that healing virtue from on high, Lord Lord, I thank you, I praise you for every blessing. I thank you, Lord God, for all the handheld requests tonight. Just pour out your spirit in a mighty way. I thank you, Lord God, for touching Brother Sullivan, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for the word that he's been preaching, Lord God. Lord God, be feeding our souls, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to receive each and every time, Lord God, to be used to your word, Lord. Thank you, praise you for every blessing. Thank you, Lord God, for touching the song service tonight. Touch the choir, Lord God. Touch, Lord God, since the third eye is this angel. Touch, Lord God, Lord God. Uh, offering, Lord oh God, the altar service in a mighty way. We pour out your spirit, help us, God, that people will be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what I'm watching online. Let it be one, Lord oh God, that's uh, not saved, Lord, help us be saved tonight. Lord God, let us not be the first night and the rest of our lives of serving you, Lord. Thank you and praise you for everything you've done, everything you've wanted to do, Lord. Have your way, Lord. have all of our visitors tonight. Yes. Uh, let's continue to worship and get our choir coming at this time ministering song.
God. Oh, what singing. Oh, what shouting. Praise, the Lord. Praise God. We better be practicing down here because that's what we're going to do for eternity over there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's continue to worship and give and get us to come and receive the evening offering. Uh, we need a good offering each and every night for our revival. We want to bless our evangelists in a mighty way. So let's uh, reach down deep. The Lord will bless you. you know, the Bible says the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Brother Zach, would you pray with us time of worship? May God reach the blessed for you, faithful and Amen. Giving. I pray for Sister Sharon and I as we minister in song. Amen. Thank you. 
Praise God. Just praise God that we're a child of the King. Praise God. Hallelujah. This time I'm turning to service our Pastor Brother Shelton. Bless you. Amen. Can you lift your hands and thank this King tonight? He's not just King. The Bible says he's King of Kings. He's not just Lord, but he's Lord of all lords. Amen. I'm glad to be on his side. The Bible said, if God is for us, who can be against us? I'm glad we're on the winning side. Can you say amen? They tell me, I've heard it said, you come to church on Sunday morning, you love the pastor. Well, you proved that this past Sunday morning, uh, that you love us and we love you. They said, if you come back on Sunday night, you love the church. But if you come on Wednesday night, you love the Lord. I'm glad I'm looking at some folks that love your pastor. You love the church, and you love the Lord. Amen? Can you say praise the Lord? How many has enjoyed these meetings so far? Have you received anything from God? It's been food for our soul. Amen? And I'm so thankful for Monday night and Tuesday night, the wonderful service last evening. It's, it's wonderful how the Spirit of God will move one way in one service and move a completely different way the next service. But it's all the same Spirit. Amen? We're glad you're here tonight. Appreciate you coming on this Wednesday night. Good to have any visitors. I don't see very many here. But our visitors, good to see our home folks tonight. And uh, those watching online, appreciate you being a part of this service. We want to pray not just for this service tonight, but for services across the land that's taking place this evening. That God will move here. God will move there. And that that roll book in heaven will grow tonight. That people will be birthed into the kingdom of God. Amen. People are going to be sanctified good. you got to be sanctified. You've got to be separated from that old life. Everything that's not of Christ has got to be dealt with. you got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. The blood will get you to heaven. That's all it takes to go there. But we're not there yet. We need the Holy Ghost to keep us while we're here on this earth. Can you say amen? Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. I believe I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for the good Holy Ghost. He's been a comfort to me. He's given me boldness. He's told me when to be still and when to speak. Amen. I want to be led by him, and I want to be full of the Holy Ghost and fire. Praise God. Amen. Appreciate Brother Eddie Sullivan. Let's give him a good hand of appreciation as he comes tonight.
All right. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I, as I was reading this, and we've all read the book of Acts, haven't we? You've heard your pastor preach on this text more times over 20 years than you could ever count. But I, as I got to reading it, verse number 2 speaks of a rushing mighty wind. Verse number 3 speaks of cloven tongues like as a fire. And as I was reading it, the Lord said, wind, fire, wine, and water throughout this New Te Testament represent in some form or in some way the Spirit of God in our life. And I, as if I know more than the Lord does, and I said, Lord, what about oil? There's four of them. I, I see five. What about oil? You know, oil's a type of the Spirit. He said, oil represents the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And he said, you don't get the anointing until you get these four that we're going to talk about tonight. Amen. I want you to be anointed. Every one of you. The anointing's not just for singing, playing, and preaching. The anointing destroys the yoke. You need to be anointed when you walk on that job site tomorrow. You need to be anointed when you pray over your children. You need to be anointed in everything we find to put our hands to do. I want to preach to you on the four dimensions of a spirit-filled life. The four dimensions of a spirit-filled life. Father, we thank you. For the word of God tonight, we ask you, Lord, that you'll just speak to our heart through and by the word and by your spirit. Give us ears to hear it, a heart willing and yielded to receive it. And I pray as we fill this altar tonight, Lord, God, that we would seek you in earnest, wholeheartedly. You said, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. God, that's our promise tonight. And God, we seek you in advance. You would open up the windows of heaven and pour out the Holy Ghost in each of us and in all of us. Let us leave full of the Spirit of God. And God, I thank you. If there's somebody lost and saved, one here sick, I know you're a healer. I ask you to heal them and raise them up. Those that couldn't be here, work beyond these four walls. Meet those that are watching or listening. We thank you for it. We ask it together in Jesus' name. If you love the Lord, would you say amen? Again, in verse number 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I found that interesting because God is pretty good at grammar. It says, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind you know anything about grammar, it's proper grammar. When you use back-to-back -back adjectives, you put in a comma in or right behind each adjective. But that's one word in the Greek, rushing mighty wind. <laughs> it's as if God needed multiple words in English to describe what he wanted to do by the Holy Ghost. He sent a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The word wind there in the Greek is the Greek word noe, and it means respiration or breath. God breathed into that room. The mighty rushing wind they heard and felt was God breathing into his church just like he breathed into Adam on the day of creation. What was the day that the church was born? My son went to a Christian school, and it was of a nominal church. It wasn't of our faith. It wasn't a Pentecostal school. 
But they told us when we enrolled him, hey, it's a Christian school. We're not going to try to indoctrinate him with our doctrine. We just teach the principles of Christianity, of Christ, of his saving grace. Uh, we understand you're, you know, Pentecostal. And, you know, we're, we're not going to try to change that in him. We like the school. We sent him there. One of the first things the Bible school teacher started trying to do because he got pegged as the Pentecostal boy in the school. One of the first things they started trying to do was to teach him that Pentecost was something back there for the disciples. All that ceased. It was only a sign to show that Jesus had risen and was ascended. All that ceased. None of that was for us. And it come to, you know, the end of that term, and he, he gave every one of them a term paper. He was grading them on their subject matter, on their content of, you know, how they presented it. And, you know, it, it wasn't just like I gave you a lesson and you showed me how well you learned the lesson. He said, no, I'm giving you the I'm giving you the Bible, and you write me a term paper, and I'm going to grade you on how you present what you're, what you're talking about. Grammar, presentation, delivery, everything. I'm just going to grade it as a term paper. And uh, I said, I got, a good, I got a good paper for you to write, son. Pentecost. He said, Daddy will flunk me if I. He'll flunk me if I write a paper on Pentecost. I said, why do you think you're in that school? He's trying to teach you that it ain't real because he's been taught that it ain't real. He never had nobody give him a dissertation of what Pentecost is, no explanation of it. And I said, I won't, I won't give you the I won't write the paper for you, but you you pray over it and you get stumped on something. You come talk with me about it. We'll go through the Bible. Man, we did. When was it? <laughs> One of the questions he had, he had asked him during the, his class is, what was the birth date of the church? And it was their denomination. He went, went back to when their church was first established, and they felt like their denominations was the only one going. And... Uh, it was a, it was the Church of Christ is what it was. And he you know, that's the answer that he had in his mind. I said, Well, one of the first things we're gonna write in this paper about Pentecost is the birth date of the church was on the day of Pentecost. God breathed. As we brought this word out, Noah, the breath of God breathed into that room, and a church was born. They came out of that church, and 3,000 souls was added unto the church. You never read that anywhere else until that church got breathed into. And just as surely as Adam was born or, or created in the image and the likeness of God, he was lifeless. There was no life. There was no breath. There was no animation in him. He was a likeness. He was an image. Well, you you carve out or chisel out a likeness or an image out of stone. You can sculpt it out of clay. Anything you want to try to make a likeness or an image out of, you can do that. But that's what it is. It's a statue. It's an image. Some people would do that and call it an idol. But God ain't an idol. He's the living God. When Jesus came to John on the Isle of Patmos, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Hallelujah to God. When he showed himself alive, when he walked into that room after his resurrection in that glorified body, he said, touch my hand and take your hand and thrust it up into my side. See that it is I and not a spirit, for a spirit hath not flesh. 
and bone as you see me have. He wanted them to know, I'm not a ghost. I'm not an idol. I'm the living Christ. I'm the living God. And so when he formed Adam of the dust of the ground, he looked like God. I believe he was a spitting image of what God would have looked like in a man. But God said, there's one thing that ain't like me. He ain't alive. And I got to put my life in him. And the only way I can do that, I got to breathe life into him. God breathed into his nostrils. He became a living soul. You want to know why you're eternal? It's because God's eternal. When God breathed into man, you ain't like a tree. You ain't like a rock. You ain't like a plant, a, a piece of grass that comes up out of the ground. You ain't like a monkey or, or a giraffe or a zebra or a tiger or a leopard or a lion. You created in God's image and God's likeness, and God breathed into you. And you, in the likeness and the image of God, you've got an eternal soul. It'll never die because God's not going to die. It's going to live and dwell with God forever or be separated from its creator forever. But your soul is eternal because God is eternal. And just as surely as God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, on the day of Pentecost, God seen a group gathered 120 redeemed by the blood, born again. He said, the only way the church is going to live is in my spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, he blew down from the throne of God. And that church came alive. Men and women come peeling out of those corridors, out of those doorways, full of the Holy Ghost. And everybody in the city heard them speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And they heard, every man heard them speak in their own language. And they magnified and praised and gave glory to this living God. That's the birthday of the church. Just lest I forget, I ain't going to say no more about it. Uh, he wrote the paper. We talked about the birthday, the origin of the church, uh, the power of the Spirit. Uh, they, they tried to explain away tongues. Uh, we brought in, if any man speaks uh, in an unknown tongue, he edifies himself. Uh, he speaks mysteries unto God. Amen. But he edifies himself. And we talked about an unknown tongue ain't a known tongue in anybody else's language, but he speaks mysteries. Oh, yeah, he gave that whole dissertation. He said, I know he's going to flunk me, Dad. I'm going to have to repeat this grade because you talked me into giving a paper on Pentecost. I'm going to fail the term paper. I'm going to fail my grade. He got it back. He got an A. And a bottom note... On the bottom of the page, uh, he said, Caleb, that was an excellent delivery. You, you helped me discover things about the Bible that I, I've, I've had to make myself read the Bible and view the Bible and think about the Bible in ways that I've never thought that I would have to question my own, my own walk with God. He said, excellent uh, dissertation and delivery. I told Caleb, there's no way you can gain say uh, anything against this word of God. You can't be against the truth, uh, only for the truth. This Bible is inspired of God. This word is God breathed, is what the word inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God said, God breathed out. When you hear the word preached, it's God breathing out. And when you receive it and believe upon it, you're breathing in the celestial word of God. The sound of a rushing mighty wind. Wind is symbolic of the Spirit of God, both in our text and throughout Scripture. This is the birth of the church, this new creation of God. 
God breathing into the church uh, with forceful respiration just as assuredly as he did into Adam. When he says of Adam he breathed into him the breath of life. It's the Hebrew word nafak. It means to puff, uh, to blow, to inflate, uh, to kindle, to expire, or to breathe out. It's a perfect parallel. Adam and the church in Acts 2 and 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent of me, baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you to your children and unto all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this underworld generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, the Holy Ghost wind blew through that upper room, inspiring that church to live, uh, inflating. Uh, that's part of the word. Uh, Nathak in the Old Testament, inflating that church uh, from 120 to 3,120 in a moment's time. If I breathe uh, or expire or to blow out of my mouth, that is the word breath. Uh, you blow that into a balloon, uh, Brother Alex, uh, and that balloon uh, is very small. I can hold it in the palm of my hand, but you got a bunch of them blew up over there in the fellowship hall for your 20-year celebration. They are inflated. That's what happens when you breathe into something. Uh, you inflate it. Uh, it's full of your breath uh, like that balloon is. Uh, when God breathed into that church, uh, it had to inflate. Uh, what happens uh, it, in God's uh, in, uh, economy? Inflation is the adding of souls uh, into the kingdom. You want to see the church grow? Get full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, let God have his way. Let the wind blow in the South Ashburn Church of God and you won't hold all the people. I believe that. It ain't a growth. It ain't a quick church growth format. It ain't teaching you how to, you know, how to build a, a, a church by the world's desire. Walt Disney World, he built his empire by giving people what they wanted, entertaining them. We, we think that that's the way you grow a church. That's the way you grow the world, by giving them what they want. This ain't Burger King. You don't have it your way. This is God's way. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. But if you let me breathe into you, I'll bring them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Hallelujah to God. They'll come from far and wide. Uh, 120 turned into 3,000 in a moment's time. I want to tell you something about wind. Wind's always blowing, moving, inspiring. Do you know wind can be heard and wind can be seen? Wind can be felt. Somebody said, how can you see the wind? I'll get there. We can hear wind by what it moves over or passes through. You hear that wind whipping through whatever it's passing over or, or going through. We hear the wind when we hear it roaring through the trees. We hear the wind when it rustles over the leaves. We hear the wind when it's making that flag flap and stand out. We hear the wind when it whistles over our ears. Man, the wind. We look outside 
we hear that wind blowing because it's whistling through that window pane. That wind's really whipping today. You feel the wind as it hits, touches, moves over you. It blows through your hair. You feel it. I walk outside with a tie on. I hate ties, by the way. My pastor told me, boy, when you go to church, you're doing the king's business. You put you on a suit and tie, you look like you somebody, because you are. You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. As much of a disservice as the bozos in Washington have done to the offices that they've been elected to, I tell you, I think every one of them ought to be voted out. I think they're blaspheming clowns, most of them. But I want to tell you, somebody put in them, you represent the people of the United States. You ain't coming up except for that bozo in Pennsylvania that walks in with a sweatshirt and jogging pants. I want to grab him by the nap of his neck every time I see him and say, I don't care if you did have a stroke. Go put a, go put a suit on. you just a mean joker. I'm sick of them, I am. But at least Obama, Biden, and every one of the other ones that I didn't support and I don't support and won't never support unless they get born again, at least they got enough dignity that when they step behind that podium, they at least honor the office by putting on a suit and tie. When I walk outside and it's windy, the first thing it's tied up right over my shoulder. Amen. You can feel the wind when it blows. John 3 and 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. He said, like the wind blows outside, that's the way the Spirit of God works. He said, it blows where it listeth. And the word listeth there means uh, wherever it pleases. The wind blows wherever it pleases. And there ain't nothing you can do to stop it. <laughs> it's a rushing, mighty wind. This is no hurricane force wind. It's not an F5 tornado type wind. Those terms, rushing, mighty, literally mean powerful and violent. It's God breathed, heaven sent, and there ain't another wind like it. They, they've got a They've got a, a scale for hurricanes, category one, two, three, four, and five. They've got a scale for tornadic winds, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, but God said, uh, you can't put the, my wind uh, on any kind of scale because there ain't another wind like it nowhere. It's a rushing mighty wind. It's powerful. It's violent. Uh, Nothing can stand against it. Uh, not Pharaoh's armies, uh, not any form of a, a, a demonic stronghold, power, or ability. When rushing mighty wind blows, uh, everything is affected by it. Amen. Wind has no boundary. The wind blows where it pleases. That's what the word listeth means. It blows wherever it pleases or wherever it desires. It touches and affects everything in its path. It blows upon the church and the heathen. It blows in the prayer closet and down the aisle of Walmart. It blows across the construction site and through the classroom. It blows under the tent meeting and into the hospital room. It blows across the street corner and into the prison cell. It blows right over the Great Wall of China, across Russia and the Ukraine. There ain't nothing to, that President uh, or Emperor Xi can do about it. Uh, there's nothing that President Putin can do about it. Uh, there's nothing Zelensky can do to stop it. Uh, there's nothing that Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, uh, or any other devil-possessed leader can do to stop it. Uh, the wind of God will blow wherever it wants to blow. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, a local school board, a 
or a state legislature or not even the Supreme Court uh, can stop the wind of God from blowing. When you walk on the job site, uh, let the wind blow. When you walk into the classroom, uh, then let the wind blow. When you're walking down the aisle at Walmart, uh, let the wind blow. Harabohosiende. Old Jack Cole, giving his testimony. He, he was an evangelist, a 10 evangelist in the late 40s, early 50s. He said, I was a drunk. He said, I, I, I was drunk somewhere every night in a bar. Many nights I didn't make it home. When I did, come in at the wee hours of the morning, staggering, drunk, talking out of my head. My mom and dad would usually help me into the bed. I'd wake up the next morning remembering next to nothing of what happened. He said, one night uh, I staggered under an old tent meeting of a Nazareth church, a Nazarene church, uh, he said, back then the Nazarenes uh, had the power. He said the preacher preached. Uh, he preached about Christ. He said somehow when he was preaching about Christ, uh, the gospel sobered my mind, sobered my heart. Uh, and I, I was sober enough to realize I needed Jesus. Uh, he said I walked down that aisle and gave my heart to Jesus. Uh, he said such joy filled my heart. Uh, he said, when I was down there asking Jesus to save me, to forgive me of my sin, to write my name in the book of life, told him I want to be born again. I want to be a new creature. I'm tired of being a drunk. Uh, he said, I felt the Lord when he lifted my sin. I felt Jesus when he come into my heart. Uh, he said, I got up. Uh, he said, never been to church. Uh, I didn't know how to say praise the Lord. I didn't know there was a word called hallelujah. He said, I was a, a lost, uh, you know, wretched, uh, drunkard, uh, never been to church in my life. He said, I got up. Uh, I looked at the old deacon that helped me pray through. And he said, uh, do you think you got it? Uh, he said, hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. He said, I went home, threw the door open, grinning from ear to ear. Said, what's wrong with you, boys, mama? Hot dog, I got it, mama. She said, daddy, come help me put Jack to bed. He's on one tonight. He said, I ain't drunk, mama. He said, I've been down to the tent meeting. He said, I got Jesus in my heart. She said, boy, she said, you better stay away from them meetings. I've heard some bad things that come out of there. He said he went to bed sober for the first time. He woke up the next morning. He said, I had the same grin. She had made breakfast. Uh, how you feeling this morning, Jackie? Any better? Did you sleep it off? Uh, he said, couldn't sleep a wink, Mama. He said, I still got it. His dad said, what you talking about, boy? Got what? Uh, he said, got Jesus. Uh, he said, all I can do, all I can do is say, hot dog, I got it. I went to work that day, walking to work, hot dog, I got it. Uh, hot dog, I got it. Uh, he said, come in the next night. Uh, Where are you going, Jack? I'm going to the tent meeting. Uh, Mama grabbed her purse. He said, where are you going, Mama? I said, I'm going with you. Ain't never seen you go two days sober. I'm going with you. He said he preached that night. Uh, Mama walked the aisle and gave her heart uh, to Jesus. Uh, and said when Mama was kneeling down trying to pray through, she said, Lord, give me what Jack's got. I want you to do in me what you've done in Jack. Uh, give me what Jack's got. Uh, said, Mama, come up out of the altar a little while later and looked at him and said, hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. They went and said, Jack, need to stop by the grocery store on the way home. Got to get some things to cook for dinner tomorrow night. All right, Mama. He said, we're walking down the aisle. She's pushing the cart. Said, stop by and got a, a, a can of a tomato sauce or tomato paste. It had a big old red sliced tomato on the outside of it. She said, Jack, I look at this uh, tomato paste. I see that big old red tomato and it reminds me of the blood of Jesus uh, that washed my sins away tonight. Uh, and said, Mama, started spinning around in a circle. 
he said, I went around the grocery store. Hollering, hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. Hot dog, I got it. He said, when I came to myself, I, I was leaned over the, the, the meat counter. All over the butcher's meat. Hot dog, I got it. He said, the old butcher's standing there looking at me in his bloody apron. So he took his old bloody apron, wiped a tear off of his face, and said, you been down there to the tent meeting, ain't you? He said, yeah. How did you know? He said, because my wife went down two weeks ago and she acts just like you. Yeah. He said, me and mama finished shopping, went to the tent meeting the next night. He said, the preacher preached and gave the altar call. And he said, I nudged mama and said, look. He said, the old butcher walking down the center aisle. Give his heart to Jesus. What's going on? The wind's blowing out from under that tent. It blew right into the supermarket, right into the meat section, right into an old lost butcher's department and had him saved in a day's time. Would to God we had let the wind begin to blow in our own heart and life. Listen. There's only one alternative if you don't let the wind blow in Ephesians 4 and 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Uh, listen, if you're not being the, if you're not letting the wind of God blow upon you, I can tell you hell's got its own wind. A wind of doctrine, a live hell, a blow across your hearing. It'll blow through your living room and deceive you that you don't need the Lord. You don't need revival. You don't need to pray. you got plenty of time. You're doing all right like you are. That's a different kind of wind. I want to tell you we're in danger every day of our lives that we disallow the wind of God to breathe into our heart and life because there's another wind that's blowing and you need God's wind to counteract that wind. Hallelujah. So even now my spirit is moving across the face of this earth. I have commanded my wind to blow throughout the four corners of this earth that I might reach all nations. For behold, these are the last of the last days. And I have opened up the heavens. And I have poured out my spirit upon all flesh. Look unto me. Listen and hear the sound. Feel within your own heart this night and know that even now as my word goes forth, is my wind blowing and my word is breathing into your heart. If you will but receive it, saith God. Lift your hands and love him tonight. Oh, God's in this house tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody reach for him tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me share with you just one more thing. I feel like the Lord, there's no way. I told you if the Lord stopped us on one point, that would be all right. Genesis 1 and 2, it says the earth was without form 
and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the word spirit there is the wind or the breath of God, moved upon the face of the waters. The word moved there is the Hebrew word rafak. And it means this, to brood, to incubate, or to inspire to life. The Spirit of God brooded over the void, over the darkness, over the lifeless water. The wind is always blowing at my house. Why? Because I live right on the coast. Even if there's no weather front, I'm, I'm just six, seven miles from the ocean. And the wind, we always got a gulf breeze blowing. Coming off that water, you go down there, and that wind's always blowing over that water. And in our in Genesis, the wind brooded, stirred, incubated over the water in Genesis, brooding, stirring, incubating. What does that mean? A hen. Her nest is called a brood. She lays an egg. She's sitting on that nest. She's brooding. What's she doing? Incubating those eggs. What does that mean? She is stirring, brooding, incubating, getting ready to bring forth life. Not just any life. It is a literal reproduction of her life. Every egg that hatches uh, it's going to, if it's a hen, it's going to look just like her. If it's a rooster, it'll look just like uh, the rooster. What's God doing when the wind, when the breath of God is breathing into your life? He's brooding. He's stirring. He's incubating. What's God up to? He is working to produce life. Not just heart beating and blood coursing through your veins. It's the life, eternal life of Jesus Christ uh, coming forth uh, out of your innermost being. Out of your belly shall flow rivers uh, of living water. It's life of God. A reproduction of who Christ is uh, is to be seen in you, felt through you, heard from you. That's what the wind come to do. He don't testify of himself. He said he'll testify of me. Listen, that wind liberated Paul and Silas and from their jail cell. It liberated all the other men that heard them from their jail. You say, well, that was an earthquake that did that, the Bible said there was a shaking. It didn't say an earthquake. The place where they were, where they were was shaken. Prison walls fell down. You know what that reminds me of? In Acts, when the apostles had been beaten and they came home and they glorified God for allowing them to be worthy to suffer for his name's sake. And they began to pray. And the place where they were was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What did Paul and Silas do in prison? They prayed, and they sang praises. And when God heard those two men of God praying and singing, it was like they were having camp meeting in a jail cell, and, and God said, breathe down there in that room. I can't handle hearing them boys pray like that and worship like that with stripes on their back, their hands and feet in stocks and in fetters. I can't take it no more. <sighs> Breathe on them boys and get them out of there. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Somebody's coming out. Somebody's going to be free. Somebody is going to know the liberty that's in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He 
You know what else happens when the wind blows? The temperature and the climate, wherever it blows, changes. You let the wind blow out of the south, uh, I ain't no meteorologist. I ain't got no degree in meteorology. No, not at all. But even a dumb old redneck boy from the coastline of Alabama knows that when the wind comes out of the south, uh, it can't stay cold. It's got to warm up. Uh, It'll be 30 degrees outside, Brother Zach. Uh, I live on the coast. Uh, we don't get much cold weather. And when that wind uh, is hitting me in the back of the head when I go deer hunting, I, all, my, all my stands are facing south. But why? Because most of the time we got a south wind blowing. But when that wind's hitting me in the back of the head, uh, and it's uh, even if it's 70 degrees, it's coming out of the north now. The front's coming in. It's about to get cold around here. And if it's 30 degrees and I feel a shift and start coming out of the south, it'll be 70 by tomorrow. You don't like the weather around South Alabama? Hang around. It'll change on you all the time. But when that wind blows, uh, whichever direction it's blowing from, the temperature's about to change. Uh, if you don't like the way, the direction you're going in, uh, let the wind of God breathe upon you. Hallelujah! It'll change the temperature of your spirit. Uh, it'll set you on fire. If you don't like the climate uh, in your church, uh, if you don't like the temperature of the, of the atmosphere, things are a little too cold here lately brother Eddie then get you get you in this altar come to prayer meeting lift those hands when the saints of God are praying and when the choir's worshiping and you'll feel the temperature begin to change and then also he said the wind blows where it listed it carries us wherever it will. Man, when I seen this, I was like, oh, God. I'm seeing now more than ever what you're doing in my life. 1 Corinthians 2 and 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Now, I, me, I would travel the easiest path. I am going to take the path of least resistance every single time. Brother Albright, if I look out there and I see trouble coming, We better go this way. <laughs> if I look down the aisle and see trouble coming, I'm looking for this exit right here. Somebody asked me, man, if you got a good church, how do you handle trouble in your church? I said, I pray God handle this. Let the good Holy Ghost breathe in this place tonight. I ain't never aimed a message at nobody. I think if you do that, you're in the flesh. You going to aim something at somebody? I'll just call them in my office. I need to talk to you. I ain't going to preach to 99 sheep over one billy goat. They don't deserve that. I'll just call the goat back here in the office and deal with him. That's the way you do that. I don't, I, I don't believe for a minute he does it either. And so if I, if I know there's trouble, I pray about that thing. And do you know? I prayed about things that I never had to deal with. Somebody come to me and say, Pastor, I was dealing with this, this, and this. But you know the Spirit of God got to dealing with me. I went to that person. I made it right with them. Everything's all right. 
they didn't know if the other person who came to me and said, you, you're going to have to deal with them. It's a lot better when God deals with you. I would take and travel the easiest path. I look out on that water. I've been, I've been deep sea fishing. I live on the coast that many times. More times than I can count. I like it. I like catching all them fish out there that is to be caught. That's fun, fun, fun. I don't get to do it often, but I've been a lot of times, and I like it. Ain't never got sick ever to a couple of years ago. I went out. I'm bad. I ain't never been sick. It was calling for five-foot seas. Captain said, it's going to be a little rough today, but I know where the fish are. If you want to go, we'll go. I had a group of men from the church. I asked them, y'all want to go? It's going to be five-foot seas. Well, yeah, we'll go. We went. You know, five foot. You don't think about it till you get out there. Shoo-hoo. Shoo-hoo. He said, man, I got we eight hours. We've been booked the whole day. He said, we're going to go out to the deep waters first. Said, I'm going to carry y'all 20-something miles out. We're going to catch this and this and this. He said, we can catch a snapper and a trigger fish in shallow water. He said, we're going to go out and catch good stuff way out there. By the time we got about 10, 15 miles out, she done rose from five foot, 10 to 15. I'm telling you, it was like. I started feeling something that I ain't never felt before. He said, Pastor, you don't look good. I said, I ain't good. I got up on <laughs> I got up on the front of the boat and I'm holding the rail. I'm letting that sea spray hit me in the face. It's just splashing all of that old cold water. Just take my breath away. I thought that'd make me feel better, it did. I started getting sick. My son in law, Corey, came up to ask me, Brother, you all right? You need me to get you anything before I can answer back? I started chumming the water. I started heave hoeing right over. He like, you need me to get? He was gone. He didn't care one thing no more about me. And as soon as I could stop long enough, I went to the back of the boat. And the captain said, we better start fishing here. I got some numbers right here. Y'all start catching fish. We're about to lose the pastor what he said. I laid on the back of that boat, and every time it hit me, I'd roll over to the side. I'd chum the water. We had, we had rode for one hour straight to get to where we was. He said, we're going to turn around, stop a few more spots on the way back. He'll start feeling better after a while. That was a lie. I mean, it was an hour all the way back. I was sick all the way back. Deck Hand said, I've seen people get sick before. I thought we was going to have to carry you to the hospital. <laughs> I said, man, I said, the devil hates me. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> the devil hates me. And I'm just telling you, I learned something that day. I checked the forecast, Brother Albright. It's calling for five-foot seas. Want to go fishing? Nope. Nope. I want glassy seas. I want slick, calm. No storm winds blowing for me. I ain't a-going. And do you know spiritually, I see the wind, stormy, tempestuous wind, blowing. God said, we set and sail. Uh-uh, Lord. Don't you see that? I don't want to go out there in that. I don't want to go out there in that. I'm saying like Peter. When they're on that storm, don't you care that I'm about to die? <laughs> don't it matter to you that we're about to die? I, but the Lord says, Sullivan, point which way you want me to take you. That's which way we'll go. I'm looking at the easiest path. So that looks good. Smooth sailing. No, no wind a blowing. Smooth sailing. That's what I want. 
I'm glad the Lord don't let me pick. Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. There's somebody there that needs it. If he had let those disciples pick, they'd say, Lord, we ain't ever been through Samaria, and we ain't fixing to go today. But the Lord said, that's where I feel the Spirit saying we need to go. We go into Samaria. If he would have said to Paul and Silas, where you boys want to go? They'd have said, we're going to go into Bithynia or into Asia. That's where we want to go. He said, but the Spirit forbade us. I saw a man in a vision, a Macedonian, saying, come over here and help us. <laughs> you didn't show me that jail cell, Lord. You didn't show me I was going to cast the devil out of that girl and get beat and thrown in jail. Because if you'd show me that, I'd have said, I think we're going to Bithynia or Asia. We ain't going, but thank God he don't let us decide. Listen to this. Acts 27 and 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon, a hurricane. When the ship was caught, in verse 15, and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And I was reading that, God dealing with me about the wind carries you where it wants to carry you. He said when we couldn't maneuver ourselves and bear up into the wind and go the direction we need to go, Brother Alex, to get out of the storm, it's a hurricane. He said, 14 days, we never saw the sun, moon, or stars, and all hope that we would be saved was lost. We threw all the tackle, all the laden off the ship to lighten the load to keep it from capsizing, and when we couldn't bear up in the wind and control the direction that ship would go in, I've never seen it. He said, we let her drive. Let her drive. Let her drive. What does that mean? We're going to have to go wherever the wind takes us. And wonder of all wonders, they carry in Paul to Rome to be tried before Caesar because he demanded, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm going to be heard of Caesar. I'm going to stand up there at trial. You ain't going to just hang me or stone me. I want to be heard before Caesar. That was Paul's request. And God said, all right then. But along the way, I got another plan. I'm going to send a tempestuous wind and blow against that ship. Everything on that ship's going to be tossed. You're going to seemingly lose everything that's precious to you except for the men on the ship, meaning everything you deem to be valuable, every material possession, all your material wealth. I'm going to let all that go to the bottom of the sea. And when you think everything's gone, and when you finally give up trying to go where you want to go, and when you let her drive, you'll find out what I want to do. When they let her drive, they ended up on an island called Malita. He said the men there were barbarous men, meaning they didn't speak our language. We had no way of communicating. He said some came in on planks and pieces of board, other on larger pieces of ship, but nobody, nobody's life was lost. He said, they showed us no small kindness, and they made us a fire, for it was raining and it was cold. He said, while men were warming themselves by the fire, Paul did what any preacher would do. He's throwing logs on the fire. I'm going to keep this fire burning and when he stretched his hand out over the flame, the sand viper came out, fastened itself on his hand, and bit him. And he shook it off in the fire. And the men 
of the island of Melita said, this man, though he survived the, the, the uh, ferocious, terrible storm that he just came through, he must be a murderer, and God ain't going to allow him to live. And they waited for the appropriate time when he should have died, and he didn't swell, and he didn't get sick, and he lived on. He felt no harm, and the men changed their mind and said, he ain't no murderer. He must be a god. And they bowed down to worship him. He said, I ain't no god. Don't worship me. I come to tell you about the god that I worship. And the Bible said he preached Christ to them, and they brought a village leader. Uh, Publius had a daughter at home, sick of the fever, laying and about to die, take me to the girl. He laid hands on her, and she was sick. And the Bible said they brought to him everybody on the island that was sick or infirmed or diseased, and he healed them all. Do you know what happened? God said, I got a, a, another plan. Not to, for you to necessarily go to Rome, but this is the last time you're going to sail, boy. And I got an island that needs Jesus. And if you'll just let the wind carry you wherever I want it to take you, I got revival on your calendar that you don't know anything about. If Acts is a chronology of the church, and many Bible scholars believe it is, Brother Alex, Acts representing the beginning of the church dispensation, a season of persecution, a time of great victory, a season of persecution, and it abruptly ends in Acts 28. This is the last story in the book of Acts. Uh, if this is a chronology of the church, uh, a timeline of what the, the church, the journey of the church, uh, all the way up to the end, if you notice there's no ending to the book of Acts. Uh, if that is a chronology of the church, uh, the church is going to have a very abrupt, uh, abbreviated ending. Suddenly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the trump of God, we're up and we're out. Somebody's going to say, what happened? Where did they go? I've just seen them yesterday. They're gone now. That's the way the book of Acts ends. There ain't no ending. There ain't no salutations. Uh, there ain't no amen at the end of it. Uh, they're just there and it's over with. The story's still being written. That's why God didn't put an amen on it. You and I are still writing in the book of Acts today. But if that's the chronology of the church, the last thing that God said is going to mark my church. Stormy, tempestuous seas, men's hearts failing them for fear of the things coming upon. He said the waves and the seas roaring. Men's hearts failing for things that are coming upon the face of the earth. He said you're going to try to you're going to try to maneuver your sails uh, and go around uh, every stormy and, and trial-filled situation in your life, but you're going to come up against this. Uh, there ain't no way around it. You're living in the last days, uh, perilous times. Uh, all hell's against us tonight. Uh, I want to tell you, it seems as though the church is on a low ebb. We cast out all the lading. We've lost all the tackle. Everything that seems to be valuable is sitting on the bottom of the ocean floor, Brother Alex. And God said, I'm waiting on you to give up. I'm waiting on you to say, just let her drive. God, wherever you want to take the church, I'm not going to abandon ship. Whatever you're doing, I believe God. Paul said, an angel of the Lord of whom I belong and of whom I serve said, be of good cheer. Stay on board. Nobody will be lost. I'm taking you somewhere. I got something better than what you know in store for you. God said, somewhere in these last days, revival. We're on course for revival. 
when it seems like all hell's against us, when it seems like the ship's about to go down, when it seems like we're losing everything precious, uh, God said, let her drive. Let the wind of God blow. Even if it seems to be stormy and tempestuous, uh, let the wind of God blow. You're headed toward my leader. I'm going to build you a fire. Here's the chronology of a church, but the chronology of Satan, and he's listening somewhere. I want him to hear. I speak as a prophet. The chronology of Satan in Genesis, he's speaking. In Acts uh, chapter 7, uh, he's striking. And just a few verses later, he's sizzling. That's Satan's end. His speaking days are about over with. His striking days uh, are about to come to an end. Real soon, he's about to be cast uh, into the fire. Ain't nothing you can stop the flame of Pentecost from burning. Let the wind blow. There's a my leader on the map. We're closer to revival than what I think we can imagine. You're closer now to your spouse being saved than what you could ever think. You're closer now to that drug addicted loved one being redeemed and set free than what you could possibly think. Uh, you're closer now to reaching Ashburn, North Carolina than what you realize. Uh, let uh, her drive. Let the wind blow. Breathe on me tonight, Lord. Let the Holy Ghost wind of God breathe in the South Ashburn Church of God, Lord. We look to you, Jesus. We call upon you, O oh Lord. We wait upon you, just like they did in the upper room. When you breathe into that early church, do it again. Our musicians would come. If you're able, stand with me all over this house tonight. Alamohusiende. Let's move into this altar, church. Come on. Why don't you just simply step out from where you're standing tonight? Listen, I would. I would to God that every believer in here would stay on your feet and lift your hands toward heaven. And I want you to ask that wind of God to blow. I want you to say to God, Lord, I've been the worst storm. If that's your lot, I've been the worst trial. But, Lord, I'm here tonight saying let her try. You know better than I do what I need. I can tell you a good dose of a hope.
glorify him right now.
was lost and alone in a cold, dark world. No peace of mind, no freedom could I see. But let 